morning, good morning. Welcome. Glad you're here, and if you're watching online, we're glad you're with us today as well. We are celebrating the season of Christmas, the Advent season, those four Sundays leading up to uh, Christmas. So we're counting Sundays of Advent, not shopping days leading up to Christmas. And uh, so hopefully we do that here, right? And uh, today we're talking about peace, uh, peace of God. And uh, I love that because I need peace. I don't know about you, but I struggle at times with anxiety, with fear, uh, with that sense of overwhelm from too much busyness, and the peace of God is one of those things I just need a lot more of in my life. I I thought we could start by uh, putting that verse back up uh, that came out of Isaiah chapter 9, and uh, it says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. Uh, he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I love that. Now, the very next verse says, Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And the reason I love that is because this idea that Jesus is the Prince of Peace is connected to the idea that he is Lord, and he is king. He is the one who is, you know, the kingdom of God is the government of God. And it's very different than the government of the United States or the government of England or the government of... It's very different than human government. And Jesus said that because this prophecy was actually shared over 700 years before Jesus came to this earth. And he is the child who was born, who would be the Prince of Peace, who is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And what what the scripture tells us is that as we submit and surrender to the government of God, to the kingdom of God, that we experience peace in an increasing measure. In an increasing measure. I, I need that. I bet you need that. God's kingdom rule and his peace go together and that as one increases the other increases and that means that I want to live in and under his authority and his kingship and I want to kind of respond to his his government that's one of the reasons why it's so important that the gospel is preached throughout the whole earth is so that people come under the lordship of Jesus and where people experience the peace of God in their life and then they can extend that in their marriages and in their families and in their neighborhoods and in their communities. It's also one of the reasons why consumer Christianity is so destructive. Consumer Christians want this watered-down version of Jesus where he's kind of their They're a good guy that's there to help them out when they need it. They're running their own lives. And then every now and then, you know, if it gets really bad, I'll call in a little help from God. A consumer Christian doesn't commit to relationships because they're messy, right? They're imperfect. They're frustrating at times. Consumer Christians are all about what is in it for me, what blesses me. And and they use church as a commodity, not as a conviction. You see, we, as those who identify as followers of Jesus, need to surrender to the lordship of Jesus where he is the center of our life, not just some add-on. Much of our world is a story of conflict. Over the past 5,000 years, there have been roughly 15,000 wars. There's an estimated 40 wars going on right now in about three dozen countries. And we as human beings, we're just not that great at establishing peace. And it doesn't matter which government you look at around the world. We're not experts. The governments of men are no experts at restoring or maintaining or sustaining peace. And the sad result is these conflicts don't just happen in countries over there or even countries here. They happen in our relationships at home, in our friendships, in our marriages. Peace on earth. Is that really possible? I mean, come on. Is it possible to experience that goodwill toward men? Now, here's the problem. When, as human beings, what I want 
can be in opposition to what you want, and then we collide, right? James chapter 4 tells us where the source of our conflicts come from. He said, do you know where your fights and your arguments come from? They come from the selfish desires that war kind of within you. So it starts with me. It starts inside of me. It starts inside of you. And it says, you want things, but you do not have them, so you're ready to kill, and you're jealous of other people, but you still cannot get what you want, so you argue and you fight. I wish that wasn't true, but it is. I see that in my own life, in my own relationships, where what I want is different than what someone else wants, and then if we're not listening to one another, then those conflicts of selfishness start to rise up. If neither of us are willing to compromise, if both of us want our own way, then sparks begin to fly. And the scenario plays out millions of times a day, doesn't it, across the world. Conflicts start when what I want is threatened by what you want. And then, of course, it intensifies with oftentimes the words that we speak, words that are disrespectful of each other. Like the guy who had a conflict with the bird. He went into the pet shop. He was just trying to get some dog food for his dog. He walks by this parrot that's sitting on the perch right by the front door. And as he walks by, he hears the parrot say, hey, you're the ugliest man in the whole world. And the guy's like shocked. And he's like, who said that? The parrot said, I did. You're the ugliest man in the whole world. Well, a guy, he calls a manager over. He's like, dude, your parrot just disrespected me, and you better deal with it. And so the manager grabs the parrot, takes him in the back room, <laughs> knocks him around, feathers flying, gives him a good talk, says, look, you will not talk to my customers that way. Don't ever tell that guy again that he's the ugliest man in the whole world. And he went back, and he put the parrot back on his perch. And the man with the dog food had the dog food under his arm. He's leaving. And just then, the parrot said, hey, you. And the man turns around. And he said, what? The parrot said, you know. <laughs> See, we're not going to experience the peace in our world until the prince of peace reigns in our heart. Because it's a heart issue. It's got to change the heart. It's not just the actions we do. It's not even just the words we say. It's what's going on in the heart. Jesus Christ came to this world to bring peace. Let's read again uh, this wonderful narrative out of Luke 2. Sets us up for the Christmas season. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, listen to this, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. Jesus was born in this time of chaos, where the Roman government had gone in to Palestine, they'd gone in and taken over the area. They were corrupt. People were distrustful of the government. People were fearful of their lives. And Jesus was born in this chaotic, disturbing time. And yet he said he would be the prince of peace who would bring peace into our lives. What that tells me is that peace is not the absence of conflict. It's the presence of God. It's not the absence of conflict. It's the presence of God. He didn't become the king that would squash the Roman government, get rid of all the stress, the strife, and the conflict. No, he was a king of a different kind who would bring a government that was different than human government because he's the God who brings calm in the midst of our stress and he reminds us that he's always in control. 
So let's talk about that for a moment. How does Jesus bring peace into this broken world, into my broken world? How does he do that? Well, first of all, Jesus brings peace with God. That's an important thing. That Jesus Christ, God's one and only son, came to this earth to make peace peace between us and God. You see, wherever our life is at in contention with God's will, there's not going to be peace in our heart. Jesus came to die in our place to pay for our sins because sin gets in the way of our relationship with God. Sin creates guilt. It creates shame. It creates problems in other people, problems in myself. And Jesus came to this earth to then hang on the cross and let the whole uh, weight of, of the sin of this world rest on his shoulders so that he would be that sacrificial lamb to atone for your sin and mine, for the whole world. And because of that, we, when we place our trust and faith in Jesus Christ, we can be made right with God. And then there is a peace that comes into our soul, comes into your soul, comes into your life in a way that nothing else can. And you know, when we don't have that peace with God, we spend our life trying to find it. We spend our energies and our money trying to obtain it, trying to earn it. Some of us, we, we just go after education and just try and become really educated or we become, try and become really successful. Or some of us just want lots of friends. And if we have enough friends or maybe enough experiences in our life, doing fun stuff, that, that will bring the peace. Others, like as I was growing up, I turned to drugs and alcohol and pornography. And so, you know, if we can't find that peace in our heart, then we'll try and we'll take it anywhere we can find it, even if it's synthetic, even if it doesn't last. St. Augustine said it this way. He said, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. So we try all of these things in order to achieve our own peace, and that doesn't really work. And yet God says, what you need is you need peace with me. That's where it all starts. Peace that passes all understanding. There's this reconciliation of the, of the relationship we were designed to have from day one when God created us. And the good news of, Christ, of, of being a Christian is that Jesus came to bridge the reconciliation issue. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 19, the Bible says this, God was in Christ making peace between the world and himself. In Christ, God did not hold the world guilty of its sins, and he gave us this message of peace. Isn't that good news? That's why the scripture, that's why the Bible is called good news. Because it's great news that God has given us his peace, that he's made peace with us and the world. And you can do that this morning by opening your heart and saying, Jesus, I need you to be my forgiver, to be my Lord, to be my leader. Well, the second thing that Jesus Christ brings peace in the area of is these uncontrollable circumstances that we all find ourselves in. Some of you are in a really hard season of your life right now. And sometimes life can be so difficult. I mean, it can be downright cruel. I know there are some here who are sick with cancer. Others who are struggling with chronic depression, anxiety. I know what it's like to have a family torn apart and what that does to your heart. How do you experience peace with all of that going on? I mean, it means every single day I have to release my control over these circumstances and trust God in my life. Much easier said than done, right? Philippians 4 verse 6 says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. And then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your heart and your mind as you live in Christ Jesus. 
Do you see the connection there with his peace and living in Christ, living in that relationship with him through prayer, through communion, through talking, through listening, through experiencing a peace that he brings because peace is not the absence of conflict, it's the presence of God. And nowhere can you experience his presence like if you just get alone with him and pray and talk to him and thank him for what he's doing and let him fill you with a peace. Experiencing God's peace doesn't mean you always feel peaceful, right? Can I say that again? Experiencing God's peace doesn't mean you'll always feel peaceful peaceful because there are times when we are in the middle of a storm and our emotional life is not like oh this is so wonderful (laughs) no it's like stressful but there's a peace that passes logical understanding that there's no reason on the outside that you would have a peace in your heart and yet you can experience a peace in your heart and in your mind peace is an amazing thing, and we long for it. You know your heavenly Father cares about you. He sees what you're going through. He's not obtuse. He's not distant. And he is, it says in in Psalm 23, that his rod and his staff will lead us through the valleys and that he'll lead us beside quiet waters. And sometimes that just means on the inside. When the Bible says the peace of God transcends your understanding, it means that as people look at your life, they will scratch their heads and go, I don't know why you're at peace right now. Because all hell has broken loose in your life, and yet you seem like you have a calm in your spirit because you're trusting God. Sometimes the stuff that hits our life, the stuff, the, those uncontrollable circumstances... If we, if we get past it, you, you can look in the rearview mirror and you can go, oh, God was with me the whole time. Have you ever done that? God was with me the whole time. There's even gifts that God wants to bring. Gifts that he'll bring to you. Experiences that in the midst of our pain or our suffering or our difficulty, God shows up, and so, sometimes it's in the moment, but oftentimes it's later where God had something to do in you, to grow you, to train you, to bless you. A couple of years ago, I decided to dress up as Santa Claus and come to our house. This is when uh, our, the grandkids were really little. Jonah, I have a picture of Jonah. Jonah was, that's that and Cassie's little boy, and he was about two. He's like a little, like he would fit, like in a stocking, wouldn't he? He's so cute. And Jonah was two, and the others were like one, and five or six, and, and all four of the grandkids were there, and all my other kids were there, and we're just, I was thinking, this is the year, I've never done it before, never done it since. I just thought, I'm going to dress up as Santa, and I'm going to show up at the door. And so I borrowed the, the Santa suit from the youth group, don't ever do that. <laughs> the beard smells like, like moldy pizza and vomit, and it's just pretty gross. But I put the beard on and had the hat and put the suit on and put a pillow in my stomach and had the velvet bag, filled the bag with gifts. And in my mind, I'm just thinking, this is going to be so fun. I had these bells, and I'm ringing the bells. I'm knocking on the door. I practice my ho, ho, ho. And I'm just there to bless the kids and just see the beauty of the wonder and the anticipation on their faces. And so they open the door, and little Jonah's there, and he sees me first. And he just starts screaming, (laughs) bloody murder. He runs up the stairs, and he grabs hold of Grandma, and he climbs up up, up her body like a little monkey. And he's like just shivering as he's afraid. And all the other kids, of course, look at him, and they react, and I come in, and everyone's crying, and I've got gifts to give out. (laughs) So from then on, they say, you remember the year of Creepy Santa? (laughs) Like, yep, I remember. God's not Creepy Santa, but there's times when we get afraid, when we're stressed out, when we are filled with anxiety, and God is actually trying to do something important. He's trying to train us and help us to trust him. He has gifts to give us, but we can miss them when we just live in that fear 
And yet God wants to turn that fear into a trust. He wants to help us see that he's in control no matter what. And that he has things to do in you and in me. Maybe you've experienced a painful divorce. And it just looks bad. But it's quite possible that as you walk through that painful time that God has something on the other side that's far better than you could have ever imagined. Or maybe you've come out of addiction, an addictive lifestyle. What could God do through you to minister to other people who are struggling, who are broken, who feel hopeless? You see, God can often take our greatest pain and our greatest failure and he can turn it around for something good. God has a way of bringing peace in the midst of our pain. Knowing God is in control brings a peace of mind in our heart, in our life. Reminds me of the story in Mark's gospel where Jesus is in the boat and he's crossing over the sea and and there's this massive storm that comes up out of nowhere, right? And the, the waves are coming over the boat and he is in the stern asleep on the cushion, it says. And they woke him up and they said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and he rebuked the wind and the sea and he said, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Fear often gets in the way of our ability to see God in the boat. To see that God is in control, that God can calm those storms and he can bring the peace. What are you afraid of today? It's interrupting your peace. Maybe afraid of what's going to happen in your finances if things don't turn around. Or afraid for our country if a new person doesn't get voted in. Or afraid for my job or afraid for my health if that treatment doesn't work. There's all kinds of things that can breed fear in our lives, and yet God wants us to peel back the layers to get to the place where you see God. It's not the absence of conflict. It's the presence of God. God wants to give you peace today. The last thing I want to just mention is that God brings peace in our relationships, not only a peace between us and our Father, our Creator, but also peace in our circumstances. And then this this other one is peace in our relationships. That's where we often need it most. Peace that comes through loving people, loving people who are hard to love. He does that by turning us into a peacemaker. You remember what he said in in, uh, the Sermon on the Mount where he said, blessed are the peacemakers, that he's called you and me to be peacemakers. 2 Corinthians 5.18 says, Anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start, is created new. The old life is gone, a new life burgeons. Look at it. All this comes from the God who settled the relationship between us and him and then called us, what? Called us to settle our relationships with each other. Being a peacemaker, it doesn't mean that you become a doormat doesn't mean that you don't feel the betrayal or the pain. It doesn't mean that you sweep under the carpet the things that have been done. No, it means that you become a forgiver. It means you become a conflict resolver, not running from every conflict that hits your life, but becoming skilled at conflict resolution in a biblical way. Often the problems that emerge in most churches are these tensions and these misunderstandings and these hurts that happen in between relationships. And then instead of resolving the conflict or speaking truth and love to one another, we pick up our marbles and we run. Out of cowardice, out of fear, and out of a lack of commitment to do what is right. God has called us to be peacemakers. To offer forgiveness to those who have hurt us. And to experience the forgiveness of God first. It's very difficult for me to forgive someone else if I haven't experienced deep forgiveness in my own life. Do you know how much God has forgiven you? Even the best of us who are like, yeah, I haven't done that much wrong. It's like, I know. But 
You've been forgiven just as much as anyone else. Every single person who's received Christ has received an amazing amount of forgiveness. And it's because of that that we can then offer forgiveness to other people. I'm not saying you forget it all. I'm saying you forgive it all. You forgive. Forgive, Lack of forgiveness, unforgiveness, gets in the way of peace. And for some of us, if you're not experiencing the peace of God this morning, it could be because unforgiveness is blocking that. And so as you move towards forgiveness, forgiving others and forgiving yourself, that as you move towards forgiveness, you will begin to experience the peace of God that guards your heart and your mind. So who is it that you need to release today? Who is it that you need to forgive today so that you can get on with your life and you can get on with experiencing the peace of God? Because it's not the absence of conflict, it is the presence of God. Listen to what Jesus told his disciples in John 16. He said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In him we have peace. He said, in this world, yeah, you're going to have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus said it's only in walking with him and knowing him, experiencing his forgiveness, and then giving it out to others that we're able to experience the peace of God. It's not, I'll have peace when. Olivia touched on that this last weekend. I'll have peace when my marriage is fixed. I'll have peace when I get that new job. I'll I'll have peace when, you know, my health issues are gone. No, it's in the midst of the tribulation. It's in the midst of our un undone life where we're able to experience God's peace and that's where the world I think stands back and scratches their head and says I don't understand why you can have that kind of peace in your life when all of this is going on around you John 14 27 I'll leave I'll, I'll end with this says peace Jesus said this peace I leave with you my peace I give you I do not give to you as the world gives Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. The peace of God that comes from Jesus isn't going to come to you by way of the world's ways. It's going to come through God's way. It's going to come as you walk with him, as you spend time in his presence. It's going to come as we learn to trust him in the midst of our problems and those uncontrollable circumstances. And it's going to come as we become forgivers of other people. So I want to just bring us into a time to pray right now and just ask that you would settle your heart, maybe close your eyes, try and get rid of some of these distractions and just pray and just ask God right now to be your peace, to ask him to bring peace to the storms, not just the storms that are those circumstances out there, but the storms that are going on inside of you to fill you with his meaning and his purpose so that you don't have to go out and pursue a synthetic peace that doesn't last. Let's pray. God, we just come to you this morning. I come to you this morning. You are the prince of peace. And you you said before you left this earth, "I, I give you my peace. Lord, I just have to be honest and real that there are times, a lot of times, I don't experience that peace. I don't feel it in my heart. and I can be so troubled, so anxious, so fearful, lacking faith. And I just ask that you come into my heart right now in this moment and forgive me and bring a calm into my life and into my heart and remind me, God, how you are in control and that even in the midst of tough stuff, Lord, that you could be bringing a gift, you could be teaching me something. There's some good that, and redemption that you bring out of it. God, I want to find my rest in you.
Maybe you're here and you've never said yes to Jesus as Lord, leader. Come in, come under his lordship. And I invite you to do that right now. Here, whether you're watching online and just pray this prayer directly between you and God. Lord, I, I receive you, Jesus. You are Lord and leader. You are the son of God. You hung on the cross for me. Lord, I pray right now that I want to be at peace with God. I want to be at peace. So, Lord, would you do that in me? Just give it to you. I give you my sin. I give you my worry. I give you my fear. I give you the way that I've messed my life up. I just give it all to you, God, and ask right now that you would begin to do something brand new in me. If that's you, just in this quiet moment, would you just lift your hand and say, Mike, I just prayed that prayer with you. Yeah, amen. Amen. Yeah. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. Lord, we, we pray right now, Lord, and ask that you bless those that have invited you into their life, into their heart. Fill them with hope and strength and courage. Let them experience your peace that passes all understanding. Lord, for all of us, we ask, help us identify whatever might be blocking the peace of God. And if it's unforgiveness, Lord, we're asking right now, give us the grace to be great forgivers, to forgive as we've been forgiven so that nothing gets in the way of experiencing your peace and walking in that peace and then to be peacemakers in all of the conflicts and all of the rhetoric and all of the disrespect we see right now going on in our land, we pray, help us not be part of that. Help us be peacemakers to speak the truth in love. Help us, God, to be conflict resolvers. Help us to be bridge builders. Help us, I pray, oh God. We ask in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.